delighted that you could uh, join us uh, this evening. My name is Am Joe Hall. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Uh, really delighted uh, to be uh, hosting Michael Roberson uh, for his talk between two pandemics. Uh, Ballroom has something to say. It's uh, particularly um, amazing to be here with bodies in space uh, together. This is our first public event since March of uh, 2020, and I really want to thank all of the staff of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement, all the tech staff, all of the people who help uh, put uh, these events together, and thank you for following all the, the safety protocols. The, the guest speakers will be taking off their masks, but ask that you keep yours um, on um, as well. Uh, I'll be uh, introducing um, uh, the other uh, guest speakers a little bit uh, later on as we um, move towards the, the discussion. But I wanted to begin by recognizing that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and the important role, uh, particularly that arts and culture and post-secondary institutions have uh, related to both um, decolonization and reconciliation. Uh, I had the delight of meeting uh, Michael in January of 2020, and we began conversations of having him come and present at SFU in, in fall of 2020, but of course it had to be canceled with the, the ongoing uh, pandemic, but we kept that conversation going, and it's really wonderful to um, have him um, here to, to speak with us. He's a public health a practitioner, advocate, activist, artist, curator, and leader within the LGBTQ uh, community. He's the creator of US's only Black Gay Research Group, a national Black Gay Men's Advocacy Coalition, as well as an adjunct professor at the New School University in Union uh, Theological Seminary in New York City. For Black History Month 2021, Michael co-authored an article in Time Magazine titled, Why Voguing in the Ballroom Scene Matter Now uh, More Than Ever. Michael also serves as a cultural consistent for Pose, the FX television show. Um, and, uh, and additionally, he's a public health advisor and community engagement specialist for New York City COVID-19 contact tracing uh, initiative. We look forward uh, to the conversation uh, this evening. So please join me in welcoming Michael Robertson. So good evening, uh, and no, I'm gonna do that again. So people who know me and know me well, though you don't, know that I'm a big fan of choirs, and when I say good evening, we'll say good evening in unison. Good evening. Good evening. Absolutely. So let me, before I introduce myself, you know, I'm gonna give a little context of what happened today. So M had emailed me and said, I, I'm gonna pick you up closer to one this afternoon. So I got ready, and I was watching some tennis, and I came outside and, and, and was in the, uh, the lobby of the hotel, staying at the Sylvia Hotel. And so I asked Emma, I said, um, are we going back to the hotel? They said, why do you need to go back? I don't think we have time. And I said, because I have to change. This is inappropriate. Right? And so he said, no. I said, listen, first of all, I am a black man who grew up with a certain kind of black woman as a mother. And I said, though my mother passed away, she would get up out of her grave, walk across the oceans to Vancouver, and pop me in the middle of my head and said, why are you dressed like that? So I'm um, real clearly and said, this is an art school. I, I said, I got it. I get it. <laughs> um, so my name is Michael Robertson. I am, um, since I start with, started with my mother, I like to theologize what it meant to come through the womb, to be born through the womb of that woman. This woman, this black woman who I call mother, in the very womb, the God of the universe had its conversation with me and implanted the very truth of who I was in the DNA in my cells. So that when I came out to the world and the world began to tell me different about who I was, the cells of my DNA stood up and said, don't believe the lie. I was born in Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey is an inner city across the bridge from Philadelphia. Um, my trajectory about Camden is that it's hood hood. I can say that because I'm from there. Um, Camden and Detroit and Baltimore, Maryland, very similar cities. I went to school there, graduated from Rutgers, applied to law school twice, got accepted, put in a waiting list, and I got tired of waiting. So I began to work for the Camden City Board of Education as a crisis counselor. Um, and then I began also doing psychiatric emergency services in two hospitals. And then I began at the same time facilitating a youth 
discussion support group for LGBT young folks of color at an indigenous black gay organization called Colors. And then I began to go to graduate school at the same time. I tell you all this for a particular reason. Um, one of the beautiful things about working for the Board of Education in the Northeast is that when the snow's real bad, you don't have to go to work. And when the weatherman would forecast snow and I would wake up in the morning, there was no snow, I started getting mad at God. I said, something has to change here. My true story. In May, of 1999, May of 1999, I was sitting home listening to Maxwell, one of my favorite artists. And I heard a voice tell me to move to New York City and do the work I want to do with LGBT young folk. July, two months later, I put in my resignation. In September, I moved to New York City with $177 worth of change. And I've been there ever since. And to, to Elm's point around in terms of my bio, I was blessed enough to do some things. And then in 2008, I got fired in a very public and painful way. The great Greek philosopher Montaigne says a philosophy is about learning how to die. Cornel West talks about education is about learning how to die. So if philosophy and education was about learning how to die, then I went to seminary because theological education was about a rebirth. And I went to seminary not to be a minister. Don't get confused with my performativity. Um, but I went to minister because I wanted to place theology in conversation with public health because I was doing public health, particularly HIV prevention with black and Latino LGBT, young, LGBT folk. And I saw folk continue to increasingly become HIV positive. And it was my assertion that the theological abomination narrative had direct impact on health disparities impacting black gay men. That you tell a people that the very essence of who they are is antithetical, is an abominable to God. And then you ask them to engage and protect the fact of a body they've been told is no good to God, was not going to work, and I wanted to change that narrative. It's blessed enough to go to Union, blessed enough to do some things there. And so for the past nine years, along with the public health stuff I've been doing, I've been doing race, sexuality, and theological work through the Center for Race and Religion and Economic Democracy. One last thing I say about me is that I am a member of an international sound art collective called Ultra Red. And Ultra Red emerges out of the ACT UP movement in 1993. And Ultra Red uses sound, right, both video and audio, audio as an investigative tool. In this space right here, we would, talk, we would call this a listening session. So I am going to show you videos in many ways to engage you in a space called listening that goes beyond the practicality of the ear. And I'm going to ask you to think about just three propositions. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? And at the very end, when we have Q&A, when, if you have a question, I want you to begin with those things. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? So I'm going to play three videos. I'm going to contextualize them real quick. The very first video is what I call a political PSA. So the critiquing um, a space around Black Lives Matters when there's been no outcry around Black trans women continue to be beat and brutalized. It begs the question, who lives matters most and Black Lives Matter, so we're not talking about that. The second one is a ballroom memorial video that remembers the body has memory, that remembers the people who have passed away, largely because of the HIV AIDS crisis. And the third one, anyone in here watches, or do y'all get RuPaul's Drag Race? Hey, this is your set. So we're, we're going we're gonna to engage that in dialogue, problematize it a little bit. Oftentimes, I, one of the things I lift up RuPaul around is that his ability to do that, particularly in a time when it was not fashionable, right? But in the way that it is, it's, it's situated, it is situated primarily through a white queer lens. That when I was younger, these lip sync performances were usually always by trans women. We only called them drag performances because we had no language called trans then. So we called trans women drag queens. And they were always on a Sunday. And that's not accidental. That this was the church that historically we were ostracized out of the space called church. And so the club for us became the church. And the trans woman lip singing became like the woman I went to go hear every Sunday. I call it a hermeneutics of the body. That's nothing but a big theological word that means how you read text. But it also was a homily. Homily is nothing, nothing but a big word that means a kind of big word. That means how one ministers. But I bring this up because the person that you're going to see is Princess Jeanne. She was an icon in the house wall community, icon in the lip sync performance community, and in the pageant community. And we do a play called Nork is Burning, and she opens up the play. We had no idea that her body was, uh, that she was experiencing a lot of pain. 
Not only was she dealing with HIV, but she was also dealing with cancer. And then she winds up passing. And I play this a lot because I want for us to remember that oftentimes how we use women, both cis and trans women, as spectators mostly, especially the church. And we had to remember that. So is that okay? That's okay. So, there'll be peace in the valley for me someday. There'll be peace. In the valley, Lord, follow me. Oh, yes. There'll be no sorrows, no sadness, Lord, no troubles will be. There'll be peace in the valley. Oh. Sometimes it just feels too fast and you 
mistakenly did not tell you was that at the very end of this, all of you will be doing that next year. <laughs> If I had a longer time to talk to you about the reason I placed those three together, it was grounded in sort of the notion of Dr. James Cone's black theology. If, if I had longer time, I would talk to you about that those three videos are grounded in a womanist theological discourse, particularly Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman's womanist choreographic methodology. If I had a longer time, I would talk to you that that is grounded in a guy named Fred Moten's notion of the black radical aesthetic tradition. Even if I had longer time, I would talk to you about that that is grounded in Paulo Freire's notion of the pedagogy of the class. But I'm going to start with this assertion. The, the African-American Harlem Renaissance writer, Zora Neale Hurston, once said that black women are the muse of the earth always trampled on over and over and over again. I oftentimes say that black women are situated, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, as the Christ in community. Nailed to the cross. Always having to self-sacrifice. Giving of herself, holding whole community together, even having to give to her oppressor's children. But if black cisgender women are the mules of the earth, then black trans women are lies and we're between Howard Thurman's notion, who's a he was the uh, black theologian, notion of the disinherited, or France Fernand's notion of the wretched of the earth. And still somehow, they make a way out of nowhere, and that way is ballroom. So I'm gonna do this historical narrative, place it in conversation with the AIDS crisis and COVID now. I'm gonna do it through the six tenets of ballroom history. I was a, a, a student of Union Theological Seminary, and womanist theology comes out of Union, and they have five tenets of womanist, womanism, and I borrow from them. And so the six tenets of a ballroom that I'm going to talk about is that ballroom is a black trans woman's theological discourse. The second one is a black freedom movement. The third one as an art collective and a black feminist movement. The fourth is the ability to use vogue and performance as an organizing tool. The fifth is that it's a radical pedagogy. And the sixth is that it's a spiritual formation. Now I'm going to do this in the beginning. I'm going to be getting ready to date myself in sort of the, the mantra of Sophia from the Golden Girls. Anybody say, yeah, they know, you know how I feel about that. But picture this, true story, picture this. If not for slavery in the US, if not for the Emancipation Proclamation, if not for black reconstruction and its dismantle, if not for the rise of Jim and Jane Crow racism and the rise of lynching and the Ku Klux Klan, if not for black folk in the U.S. moving from the southern part of the U.S. to the north looking for new spaces of freedom, Harlem becomes the new black mecca. If not for between 1919 and 1931, the construction of a black political artistic movement called Harlem Renaissance. If not for the black church in Harlem creating a three-decade campaign to get rid of black queers, the use, the minister there use the owned the answer that news had used the newspaper to publish his sermons. And there were three ways that black queers congregated during that time. At rent parties, which is nothing but to have a party to pay your rent. At beauty salons and drag balls. And drag balls become the largest sort of movement or gathering convening of black queers. And so the first thing I say about ballroom, that is a black, a black trans woman's theological discourse because it creates itself in contestation to the black church creating out of this notion of matter. What does it mean, right? What does it mean to find new home, new freedom, and we're not free here? We're homeless in a new home. But after World War II, where other cities become blacker in the US, DC, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, these drag balls migrate. But in 1967, a particular black trans woman in Crystal Abasia, she resisted racism or colorism in the pageant drag ball circuit. And if you want to look her up on YouTube, it, it, the actual moment that happens is on YouTube called the legendary Crystal Abasia. And she walks off stage in her sort of political critique. She goes on this tirade. And it was an, an African-American drag performer named Phil Black, who was the only African-American drag performer who had a screen actor's guilt card. And he whispers, the whispers my reimagination. He whispers 
in her ear. Let's go back to an old Harlem drag ball circle. In 1967, they had a ball. In 1968, the very first house was created. Why this is important? Because, because the, the beginning of the Harlem drag ball circuit was called drag ball because it was for trans folk who participated. Anyone could come to. But we didn't have a language for trans. But this began the morphing from drag ball to a political theological construction called houses. Right? Houses named after these famous trans men. So Chris Labeja creates the very first house, House Labeja, and there's these five black trans women who are called freedom fighters, if you will, that come sort of after her. They're walking at the same time to come after her. Pepe Labeja, you don't have to remember this, but Pepe Labeja, Dorian Corey, Avis Pendarvis, Paris Dupree, and Duchess Lowell. Dorian Corey is interesting because we are actually blessed enough to do, we're getting ready to do a Hulu project looking at her legacy. I'll go back and talk about that a little later. And so in 1973, the very first gay man begins to walk a ball. So between 67 and 73, the construction of houses begin to form. And they're in relationship with other art and political movements in the late 60s and the 70s, like hip hop. We had longer time to talk about sort of the theology of hip hop and how it was created. Like salsa in many ways, like the New York poet movement. So this third tenet was that not only was ballroom a black freedom movement because it migrated across the, the second tenet because it migrated across the country in contestation to some oppression, but its third tenet in the 60s and late 70s, in the late 60s and 70s was that it was an art political movement and also in conversation with a lot of black feminism that was happening in New York City. As the 70s began to form other houses coming out of Brooklyn, more gay men began to participate. And they began to participate in ways that, in, in many ways, that I call patriarchal formation that had real devastating impact on house ball community. I'll talk about that a little later. But 1981 happens. And part of the reason that I wanted to, to lodge this because between two pandemics, the call between two pandemics, because I wanted to talk about the AIDS crisis and COVID. Because it here's two, this year happens to be the 40th anniversary of AIDS, and ballroom is caught between the two, and there's a protocol I call of becoming. Right? So 1980, 1981 happens, and this surveillance of 41 gay men having this rare cancer, public health in the U.S. call it GRID, gay-related gay infectious disease. I oftentimes say what it means for a community to be named after a terminal disease, what it does to the psyche and the spirit of a person or a whole community. It would be like as a black person, because black people have large, uh, have high prevalence of diabetes, diabetes is called black beans. What it did to this community be called named after a terminal disease. Ronald Reagan was president and his neoliberal politics and his regime. He deregulated banks, he cut social programs. He was very, very, very highly uh, 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 invisible, if you will, around AIDS. When 1984 happens in crack, and so his war on drugs, he, he was hyper around it. I talk about this notion of disposable bodies, one, because AIDS were killing gay men, and so these bodies were deemed disposable, and crack had, and his war on drugs had an impact on black Latino men. So the mass incarceration of these disposable bodies. Why this is important to this community, because in 1986, gay men began organizing, partly because the, the politics in black community made a political and intentional decision not to deal with AIDS. In fact, the notion was that if black gay men were getting AIDS, black gay men deserved it. It was God's way of getting rid of perversion from the earth, and it was black gay men's punishment. And so black gay men began organizing in such a way. 1986 is important because as black gay men begin organizing, the house ball community migrates out of the U.S., I mean, out of the U.S., out of New York City to other cities, to Washington, D.C. in 86, in 89, to Philadelphia, and 1990, Baltimore. And as they begin to migrate and black gay men begin organizing, they ostracize the house ball community in AIDS organizing. And there's a classist notion around these folk were deemed disposable. There's a, a, a great scholar named Kathy Cohen who wrote a book called The Boundaries of Blackness. 
she sort of critiques, she does an analysis around the political regime, around AIDS and black community, and makes this assertion that as black gay men began and largely became infected, black community made a decision to turn his eye. And as black gay women began to be infected, turn his eye until Magic Johnson became infected. Well, black gay men began to do the same thing for the house ball community. But here's an interesting thing. As Housewall began to migrate across the country with no agency, if you will, no advocacy necessarily formated, for, formalized around its crisis, two things happened, two emblematic artistic movements or moments. Madonna's video and song Vogue. How many people have heard of that? And Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning. Now, one of the things about Paris is Burning that it is an absolutely artistically wonderful documentary. In fact, it's one of the most watched documentaries in history. You go to the academy, anyone who is studying um, uh, cultural studies or performance studies or queer studies, it is part of the curriculum. So it's artistically wonderful, but it happens to be culturally exploited through the lens of a white queer woman named Jenny Livingston. And Madonna, who still today has never sort of talked about, never owned that the cultural production of Vogue came out of the house ball community. But one of the things Baldwin began to do was as Madonna nationalized, in fact, there were two black women who had Vogue in their videos before Madonna, Queen Latifah and Jody Wilder. But Madonna nationalized it. And so Baldwin began to use what Madonna did and use Vogue as a way to organize across the US. In the early 90s in Chicago, in the mid 90s in Atlanta, in the late 90s in Los Angeles and in Oakland, and in the early 2000s in other places. And one of the beautiful things that happens in the early 2000s is this relationship with Paris. It's a young black queer person who now identifies as trans left Paris at the late 80s, early 90s, looking for a black, black gay community, finds, comes to New York City in search of one, comes to the pier in New York City and finds ballroom and joins a house, the House of Ninja. Stays in New York City for about five or seven years, returns back to Paris and creates the ballroom community in Paris. And then creating the ballroom community in Paris begins to create the black LGBT community. Most of the community in Paris are migrant, poor migrant Africans, and also poor migrant folks of color. Very different than the salacious relationship that Baldwin's had with other European cities that oftentimes are connected to capitalism. But I want to move back. There's a wonderful documentary called How to Survive a Play. And it sort of it, it crystallizes sort of act up and its movement, its ability to organize effectively. And at the very end of the documentary, there are about five or six uh, ACT UP members who begin sitting around, who, who are sitting around talking to one another. And they begin to have a conversation that, they, that said that they thought their lot in life was to watch each other die. Folk were around them, were passing away. There was, it, it appeared to be no way out. And then they make the assertion, we begin to live. And I asked myself the question, who are the we that they were talking about? And they began to live because in 1996 was the creation from Merck Pharmaceuticals of the triple peer to combination therapy, which allowed gay men, mostly who was impacted, to go undetectable. But who are the we that they were talking about? Why do I bring it up? Let me jump forward to 2001. 2001, New York City did a study called YMSM. YMSM is just a term meaning young men who have sex with men. And it was an HIV prevalence study. And prevalence just means how many people have it. When you think of COVID, we think of case count. How many cases of COVID are there? And one of the things that came out of that study was that for African-American young men who have sex with men, that 33%, one out of every three, between the ages of 18 and 29 was HIV positive. That was huge back then, absolutely huge. In 2002, they did an incident study. An incident just means how fast is the infection growing. If you think of COVID, that's a positivity rate. 
And for researchers to look at to level off an infection in the community, the incident rate needs to at least be 3% or below. And so what they found with young white men who had sex with men between the age of 18 and 29, the incident rate was 1.5 to 2%. That was very good. There's some structural reasons why their rates went down, but that was absolutely great. With Latino men in the same age group, the incident rate was about 3.5 to 5%, which means it's growing faster than it needs to be. In Sub-Saharan Africa, where at the time there were 24 million people who were HIV positive, the incident rate was 6%, three times as fast as white gay men, almost twice as fast as Latino gay men. But with young black MSMs, the incident rate was 13%, twice as fast as Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub -Saharan Africa. 2003, they did a house ball study. And there were some black trans women in Baltimore who contracted TB. The Baltimore, health, the Baltimore Department of Health was not as nuanced as New York, and they put out a communication that there was a rise of TB within the trans community. They did not realize that the, these trans folk had had sex with some gay men in the house ball community, and these folks migrated. It must have been about six of them. They migrated from Baltimore to Philadelphia and to New York City, and New York City put out a health alert around rise of TB within the house ball community. The Center for Disease Control said, what is a house ball community? Okay. Given the fact that Atlanta has the second largest house ball community geographic in the US, and the Center for Disease Control is in Atlanta, they asked the question, what is a house ball community? And if it exists, then if TB exists, there must be some HIV, we need to study it. So they did a study of prevalence within New York City in the house ball community, what came out of that was 70% of the house ball community in New York City is HIV positive. I'll give you about two or three more epi, uh, epi data. In 2005, they did a five city study looking at HIV prevalence once again. They looked at New York, Baltimore, Miami, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And no longer was it 33% of black women HIV positive between the age of 18 and 29. It was now 46%, one out of every two, no outcry, one out of every two. 2007, New York City put out a health alert that there was a rise of HIV among young black and Latino MSMs. We were not surprised. The surprise was the age range. Usually when we think of that, that demographic, we think of the folks between 18 and 24, this looked at people from 13 to 21. 2011, CDC put out a, a communication that said for the very first time in the history of the epidemic, there was a decrease in HIV incidence across the new HIV infection rates across all demographics except for with black gay men. There was a 48% increase. 48% increase. Still no outcry. 2016, CDC put out communication that one out of every two black gay men between the ages of, no, one out of every two black gay men by the age of 40 will become HIV positive. One out of every two. One of the things, one of the assertions that CDC has talked about is that how is it that young that black gay men in the U.S. have the highest HIV prevalence and incident rates, not in the, the northern part of the U.S., not in the southern part, not in the Midwest, not even in the U.S., but in the whole world outside of Botswana, South Africa, how does that happen? How does a marginalized black gay community and a marginalized black community in the U.S. have the highest rate in the whole world outside of Botswana, South Africa? Still no outcry. Well, we begin to see a trend. In late 2006, a young black gay man named Lorenzo, who was in one of the houses called Muglia, winds up dead in his apartment, HIV positive, struggling with crystal meth. A month later, one of the icons in the house wall community in mystery winds up dead, HIV positive. Two weeks later, one of the young black gay men who did the work with the house wall community around HIV prevention winds up dead, HIV positive. April 2007, Lorenzo's very best friend, Javante, winds up dead, HIV positive. May, my own kinship self, Ray, in the house of Manolo Blahnik, winds up dead, HIV positive. June, Leon, in the house of Mugler, winds up dead, HIV positive. 
August, an iconic trans woman winds up dead. Her name is uh, Banji Angie Infinity, winds up dead, HIV positive. In December, an iconic trans woman who remained nameless winds up in a hospital with nine infections, 45 T-cells, in a 30-day coma, and she survives. 2008, we see the numbers increase. 2009, we see the numbers increase. And we began to realize this trend was not just in, just in part of the larger community. It was concentrated in the house ball community. How was this happening? How is it that with greater access to treatment, greater access to care, greater access to prevention, greater access to testing, our folks continue to die? or that resurgence of dogs. And we begin to organize around that. So the fifth tenet of ballroom is that it's a radical pedagogy. Because it uses the notion of ballroom resiliency to create interventions, not interventions. Interventions suggest that someone who has more power coming into your community to intervene. But interventions talks about the, the, the resilience of a community to, be, to, to take care of oneself. And we begin to organize around that. I'll talk about Two of them, there's a whole bunch of things I could talk about, but I'll talk about two of them. One is called House Lives Matters. As you saw the video of the PSA, House Lives Matters was created in 2016. In many ways, it's a critique. It nuances Black Lives Matters, of course, but it's also a critique that these numbers continue to increase around HIV where black, and black young black gay men and black trans women continue to be beat and brutalized in large numbers, and there is no outcry. But we also wanted to go beyond the historical notion of HIV, that oftentimes the only conversation we're having about the house ball community is articulated through the, the, through the illness or the pathology of AIDS. There were other sort of intersectional disparities impacting this community. The other thing we wanted to do was use the resiliency of a community to talk about that the house ball community was organizing and predating AIDS. And so if you use that historical resiliency, you can begin to shift something. And the other thing we created, one, there's a whole bunch of things, but one other thing I'll talk about is this notion called the Arbor Santana Ballroom Freedom School Project. It was named after, of course, um, what was, it, it was lodged in, in the history of the Freedom School Movement. The Freedom School Movement is a 1964 Freedom School Movement in the U.S. Uh, and its ability to use, again, the cultural production, the theological production, the pedagogical production of the Baldwin community to address its concerns. Because our question continued to be, where was the outcry? The where in this moment, again, during Black Lives Matter, was the outcry. And the last thing I'll talk about ballroom is that it is absolutely a spiritual formation. Absolutely. That it creates a space, it convenes a folk around this notion of mattering. Talk about that for black folk, that through the constitution of America for 200 years, we were, we were not human. And talk about for queer folk, that through the theology of Christianity, we were an abomination. So one has to create a formation that only counters that, that denounces that, but announce something very different. I'm going to show two videos that are examples of that. One is an international, I call it international Wonder Woman, named Leomi, who is a, a dancer. So your hands are like, oh, Leomi. And... Uh, um, we interviewed Laomi for a borrow or history project. And Laomi said to be black, Latina, reared in the Bronx in New York is to be angry all the time. I vogue to save my life. Vogue to save my life. In the late 1950s, James Baldwin once said to be black and relatively race conscious is to be angry all the time. I write to save my life. He then exiles to Paris. I'm not going to I was going to show you the video of Laomi voguing in Paris, but I want to show you the video of Nike doing a commercial around her called the Equality Act. And then I'm going to show you a video of a young Latino gay man in the housewall community who's a voguer, who's actually my kinship son. 
And he comes into my life as I was doing an intervention for one of the community-based organizations in Brooklyn. And he tells me he's a poet. I said, okay. I think he's going to say, roses are red and violets are blue. Um, but he really begins to use what I call sort of the, the tradition of black poetry. And he was born in New York City. Family moved to Florida. His mother became involved with a new man. And this new man had no room for anyone who was gay. So his mother shipped him back to New York City, to New York, and he lived in Long Island with his uncle and his uncle's wife. And they knew he was gay, but found him in the room with another guy, and his uncle came to him and said, you know, my wife doesn't like that, so you're going to have to move. So he said, give me a week. His uncle then tells the rest of the family, not only that he's gay, but they add something that was not true, that he was HIV positive. So he leaves the house the very next day. He winds up living on the trains in New York City and in the parks in New York City, and he goes on a dating app, and he meets an older black man. The black gay man woos him, asks him to go out to dinner, to movies. They're too late to go to the movies, so they go to dinner. Then he says to him, why don't you come back to my hotel room and chill? And so they do, and he calls three other guys to come beat and rape him. And he used his poetry to not only exercise, right? to not only contextualize his pain, but as a way to tell his story. So he goes to a poetry slam, and he does it. So I want to show you those two, and then we'll end there and invite folks up, right? Hey, Lay, what did you do to make a mark on this world? What mountains did you climb? Which angels gave you their wings? Which skies have you flown? And when you reached the heaven, who was there to catch you when you fell? And did they tell you that you saved them too? Like you saved me, that they're mending your wings and holding them up to the sun, just to step back and watch you fly. So go ahead, lay. Fly. the struggle to be a part of the fight. You see, some of us fight for a cause unseen because others choose to go blind until it affects them, but my fight isn't going to end. You see, this clock of mine reads exactly this. It was two years, two months, seven days, and 21 hours ago that I decided to own up to who I am. And it was two years, six days, and 15 hours ago that I was first judged. Exiled from my preference and emotionally slain, discouraged from following the path that I had previously lain, and it was one year and two months ago that my life on the streets began. Never knowing the hustle. Never knowing the dangers on the streets, and I had to grow up fast, believing life will get better. So simply put, I thought to myself, man, forget the past. But you see, this clock of mine, it must be broken because it was one year and one month ago today that I was raped. Some people believe it's hard for men to get raped, but ask me how easy it was to break free from three angry men punching, kicking, screaming, pleading for God's help. I lay beaten, beaten as the result of my mother's inability to protect her young because a man came first. No, see, this clock of mine, it must be broken. 
because it was one year and seven days ago that I discovered a high. And as I allowed every drug to run its course through my veins, numbing the pain as I was sold for profit so that I didn't go hungry, you see, that was modern day slavery. Street corners marked with my blood and bed sheets stained with a grown man's will to be pleased. And it was one year ago that I caught my first charge. Not only making me a statistic five times over, but breaking my spirit as I gazed at the people on the other side of the bars. And that was the zoo. And I was the young man caged for the rage that finally erupted. You see this clock of mine, it must be broken because all the while I've been calling my mother, begging for money to eat and a way home. Please, I cried, I screamed, self-mutilated and deemed myself unworthy. Alone is a feeling I'm much too acquainted with. Discomfort is a feeling I'm much too acquainted with. Anger is a feeling I'm much too acquainted with. But at the time, see, where was my joy? And it was 11 months ago that I made my way out. Nine months ago that I found myself on Florida a and campus. And eight months later, which is today that I speak the words that need to be heard judged carefully. Welcome willfully. Listen to the cries of those around you, because remembering the pain of not being heard can disintegrate the soul, and every day I remember. See, this clock of mine, it isn't broken. It's just that the arms of my mother refuse to move, refuse to get to a position in which time reads that she is ready for me to fit into her life again, the embrace I've been waiting for. Nevertheless, she refuses to comprehend these words that I've spoken. Love unconditionally. Although you may not be loved in return, for this, this is the lesson that even I had to learn. I forgot to talk about it, to mention, I mentioned very quickly, this thing between through this fifth tenet of being a radical pedagogy and a spiritual formation, that the construction of houses created now a fit, almost 50 plus year kinship structure. Some people call it an adoptive family. And that these adoptive families, if you will, is kinship structure have saved lives. Because he talked about that his, his, his clock wasn't broken, but his mother's arm refused to move. And so what happens is that we step in oftentimes. And for a lot of young folk in the Baltimore community, their gay mother, gay father, house mother, house father, is the only, particularly father, it's the only one they know. And so I, I, I share that because he is my son. And I do it also in honor. I had a son named Joseph Jefferson who worked for me, who lived with me for four years. He did community organizing, did HIV prevention. He was out about being gay, out about his HIV status. In 2010, he was home with his partner watching the movie Happy Feet. Went outside, took out the trash, came back in. He was irritated for whatever reason. And he was irritated, and his partner and him began to talk, and his partner dis- de-escalated him. And he said, I'm going to go to bed. Why don't you come with me? So his partner said, I'm going to finish watching Happy Feet, and I'll follow you after the movie. His partner fell asleep, fell asleep on the couch and woke up to hearing Joseph's alarm clock go off. And so he calls into the room. Joseph doesn't answer. He goes to the room, and my son had taken um, hair clippers and shaved off all his hair on his head and his facial hair and hung himself from the ceiling fan. Now, here is a young man who was connected to services, was connected to folk. And he wrote on Facebook right before he did it that I can no longer grow up in a world that's grown so cold to those of us who live out of the circle of life. And though he harmed himself, though he hung himself, this kinship structure, particularly in house walking in, saved life. That when it end with that, I know it feels somber, but it's absolutely, utterly real. This community is on intimate terms with death all day, every day. But still, somehow, it creates spaces of joy, love, of messiness. It's messy. Let's talk about the messiness. And it saves lives. So thank you for being here with me.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael. Um, I'm just going to introduce our, our panelists who are going to also introduce themselves and also uh, respond um, uh, to the talk. Uh, Henry Daniel is an artist scholar with a teaching and research specialty in dance, performance studies, and new technology. He's on to my far uh, left. Uh, next to him uh, is Travis Solway, who uh, is a social epidemiologist whose research investigates population health inequities in the context of stigma. He joined SFU's Faculty of Health Sciences in 2019, coming with 18 years of experience working with sexual minority communities to inform and improve public health interventions. Uh, to my left is, is Justine uh, Chambers. She's a dance artist living and working on unceded Coast Salish territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Her movement-based practice considers how choreography can be an empathic practice rooted in collaborative creation, close observation, and the body as a site of cumulative, uh, a, a site of a cumulative embodied uh, archive. Um, and also joining us uh, via Zoom, hopefully this is all gonna work out. Oh, great. <laughs> this is Ralph uh, Iskamilin, who's uh, in uh, Ontario right now, a Canadian porn queer, Philippine X diasporic creator based on the unceded and stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh uh, nations. Uh, uh, he's been involved in the ballroom scene since 2014, opening his own kiki house of Gavasi Laidia, and the founder and artistic executive director of the nonprofit organization uh, Van Vogue Down. So wonderful to have you all here in, in conversation. I'm going to start with um, Henry, Daniel, if you could, to please introduce yourself a little bit more and share some thoughts on uh, Michael's talk. I do this with all my hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, you already introduced me, but um, uh, how do you follow that? <laughs> um, I mean... I think the thing that I really, that really caught me, and, and maybe it has nothing to do with us, maybe it has everything to do with us. Um, you were up there like a, a minister, and um, when you talked about the structure of your house, um, and I saw you ministering up there, I, I, I just got the sensation of there are a whole lot of other structures that are up there that we know so little about. And, um, and perhaps because we know so little about it, we, um, we ostracize it. Um, and maybe if we knew a little bit more about not only the structure and the, the, the empathy and everything that puts that together, perhaps we would be a little bit more empathetic. Um, yes, you, 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 all the, all the churches I've ever been to, all the, and I've been to a lot of them as a young man. Um, all the sermons I've, that, that I've had. Um, and the main thing I loved about being in church was singing. Because it allowed me to be a participant. Um, and sitting here, I felt as if a whole lot of, of history was circulating and coming back to me. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Henry. I'm going to go over to Justine. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I also, uh, I felt the power of the preacher also very much. Uh, and I, the whole time I kept thinking, oh, is this the cadence of care? Like, is this the cadence of care? It just felt like there was this rhythm that I said before we left, I'm going to write the whole time because I can't listen anywhere else. And I was like this. Not, not 
like completely in the flow and, and not order um, because it's felt, I loved your question for all of us to talk about what we hear and see and we feel. Um, and I heard the cadence of care and um, I felt like the privilege of, of seeing bodies that dare to be well in spite of uh, the lack of offerings of wellness from like everything. <laughs> <laughs> of, um, and then this thing you said they make a way out of no way and that that's that's sort of echoing echoing through my body um, and for me relates just so much to how how black communities have always done that and uh, we talked about a little bit before um, and 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 how it's clear to me after hearing you speak that this is this is the power of kinship uh, uh, and when people say, oh, they, you know, they got through the adversity and it's not about a pushing through, it's about a finding otherwise. And this is really like what I really became so clear. And, and certainly, um, I'm a mom, so there's many things that like bleh, grab my body, um, uh, because I can't, I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine not having space for my child. Um, but yeah, so like my, um, mm -hmm. I just feel like it's a real privilege for us to be privy with what such generosity and such clarity, like, and, and, and it did, it felt like song, it felt like dance. It, it, it had this way of, of activating my cells. Um, because what I, what you're sharing is, is, is what's lived. It's not theoretical, and I'm I'm so grateful when we can speak practically and not theoretically. And and um, yeah, I'm, I'll take you out for coffee later. <laughs> I feel like I should not take up more space. Thank you, Michael, so very much. Uh, Ralph, I hope you can hear us uh, over in Ontario where you are. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over to over to you. Um. Hello, Icon. <laughs> um, before, uh, um, in ballroom, Michael is an icon. Uh, so if you know the history of what it means to be an icon, it's, it's a very big status in ballroom. It's the highest status. So I, as a person in ballroom, um, as Posh Desalia, oh, <laughs> Basquiat, I can finally announce. So this is the first time I'm sharing that. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to give my uh, admiration and uh, love for being a part of this. Um, I also want to acknowledge before I continue, uh, I'm on the traditional territory of the Wendat, uh, Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas and Credit First Nations, which are covered under the Treaty 13. Um, yeah, I, I feel knowledge and hearing the history um, in such depth that you have, Michael, I think is even being in ballroom can be so rare and not as frequent uh, just because of the speed of how ballroom culture is expanding uh, and globally. And so even though I have people like Felix Milan or even talking to Deshaun or Laomi, um, I find like every time I, I meet new icons or new people from ballroom from a different generation, I, I learn so much more and I'm even more enthralled and excited. Uh, and I think the biggest thing that this also reminds me is that, and I always share this with other people, that when I talk about ballroom, we hear about Paris is Burning as like being the, the introduction. And I think because of that documentary and the time frame that that comes from, people tend to think that it's, it was an isolated event. But ballroom continues in, until today. And... And like you said, has become not only in New York, but the rest of the world, uh, a safe haven and uh, an opportunity for a possibility of queerness that may not be on TV uh, in the music we listen to. Uh, but for me, at least, has become a, a place for me to find a sense of queerness that I think uh, is unique to me and is uniquely ballroom. Um, yeah, so thank you. And I'm so excited to continue talking with all of you. And, and 
I'm going to talk to you more because I heard you doing your damn thing in Vancouver, so we'll be talking. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Ralph. I'm going to pass it over to Travis. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, I'm feeling very honored and humbled to be here. Um, it's uh, a funny thing happens when you become a professor. Suddenly people <laughs> ask you to come and sit on on stages and panels and you have these moments of um, feeling like an imposter, like what am I going to have to say? Um, but uh, I also felt just completely activated um, by, by that hour. Um, I, I, I think I just want to say a few reflections on um, what I can learn, what um, some of my students can learn, or <laughs> some of us working in public health can learn from what you've just offered. Um, I think, you know, I'm aware, first, of my position as a settler here, and, and although I continue to try to do work with Indigenous communities to figure out how I can lift them up and hold them up, I, I, I'm, I'm constantly reflecting on, you know, what does this mean and how do I need to check my ideas about where things um, come about? And also, as a, as a white man, and listening to some of the stories you've shared remind me, like, wow, uh, th th there's a lot of learning to do. I think... The, the concept that, that really um, stuck with me was this idea of an intervention um, in public health. So I've, I've worked um, as, as an epidemiologist, so thank you for the statistics. You're helping teach my students <laughs> about incidence and prevalence. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've, I've worked for the last 10 years in various capacities with a provincial public health agency, and, and a lot of my frustration in our work in public health comes from uh, yes, a, a, a very top-down intervention sort of approach, but also a kind of a one disease at a time uh, approach, right? So, okay, whether we're talking about um, HIV or COVID or diabetes or suicide, you know, okay, how do we respond to this issue? And then we work backward, you know, and find the most proximal solution that's intervening, whether it's a vaccine or a medicine. or And this concept of an intervention is just so radically different, uh, like being from the community um, being uh, something that is rooted in culture and context and something that I think therefore um, really blows all these other public health ideas out of the water because you have the potential now through this intravention of Baldwin to, um, to heal and repair across all kinds of topics and diseases of public health interest. I just think um, and I see that in my indigenous colleagues here too. I mean, we're having a real moment right now in Turtle Island with Two Spirit organizing, uh, just here in, in what we call British Columbia alone, there's four or five new groups starting up, Two Spirit organizing groups. And they remind me, they have a lot of these same qualities of what you're, you're talking about, where it's really, um, let's put aside our notion of what we need to do to intervene to stop this particular public health problem, siloed one disease at a time, and let's actually just start with where people are at. So I think that's hugely inspirational, and I'm, I'm really humbled by what you're sharing. Thanks. Uh, Michael, this is your first uh, visit to Vancouver, but you've been going to Toronto and Montreal and other places. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, your community building uh, work that you've done uh, north of the border? So, a couple of things. Let me tell you what was happening to me as I was sitting up there. So, I said, um, I, said I have my son, this is a bottle. Um, do you, do you all sell Excedrin here? And he said, well, I'll go get some. So, he brought some Tylenol. And I knew this was going to happen. I took the Tylenol, and it began to work as I began to talk. That's why you saw me talking so quick. I said, oh, God. <laughs> Um, so that's number one. But number two, you know, so one of my great colleagues, I'm going to go here real quick. So the notion of intervention I didn't create, you know. Um, my, my good colleague named Dr. Marlon Bailey, he wrote the very first dissertation on the house wall community called Butch Green Up in the Parks. He did it out of Berkeley. Um, he did it through a cultural performance studies. Um, so that's his language. Um, and this notion of an intervention, I, I mentioned house lives matter, this thing around kinship. So, and to your point around, this thing around being outside, inside, so I have a kinship daughter who's cisgender, heterosexually defined um, Asian, named Dr. now, Jen Foley, younger, much younger than me, of course, 
who conceived Housewives of Madness, and she struggles with the fact that she was not indigenously born. Was she intervening or was it an intervention? It was absolutely an intervention. But the other person, so Sean Van Sluis, um, who's the executive director of the Musa Geddes Foundation, which is in Guelph, Canada. And I met him through a great colleague of mine, Alessandro Camarico, who runs the Free Home University in Mexico, Italy. And he engaged me in some work for the past five years. And one of the things we began to do, I, he, no, actually, Alessandro introduced me to a wonderful man named Brandon Hay, who defines himself as black and cis and um, heterosexual, and he's Jamaican born. It's a lot, right? Particularly when you think around homophobia and wanting to engage in a relationship with black LGBT folk. And uh, Brandon Hay and I began to talk about collaborating, and he's in Toronto. Um, and the, so the Musa Geddes Foundation flew me to Toronto to go to, to, to attend a conference. And I met Brandon and I introduced Brandon to Sean. And we began talking about um, having this relationship, this binational conversation around uh, justice making, freedom making within black communities between the US and, and particularly Toronto through the work we were doing in New York City. So to have this conversation through the work we were doing in New York City around the freedom school work at House Lives Matter. Um, and so there were three young black gay men in the ballroom community in Toronto, one named Twisted, one named TKO, and one named Marvell. Um, you know, first of all, let me back up. You I love because every time I was offbeat, I kept looking at you, you were shaking your head, and you were telling me you were right on time. So <laughs> um, and so we've been doing work with, with in Toronto for the past three or four years. One of the things that we begin to do was branded and twisted and I was to work on this thing called the Black Journeys to Black Liberation Symposium. It was a weekend uh, conferencing around looking at, again, this conversation about justice making within Black communities across all demographics, but infusing the work around the house ball community and centering it by having this ball for the Black, the black Freedom Ball. Um, and so we continue to do that work. We're also doing work looking at this relationship between the house ball community in Western and upstate New York and Toronto, partly to your point about this notion around public health, because the, the borders are not so separate that sexual activity and transmission is not happening, right? Um, but how you begin to organize around some of these intersections of disparities by using sort of resiliency of both of these communities. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna, um, we, since we have a couple of people who teach and dance here and choreography, a number of things, uh, one of the things we didn't speak about was sort of the movement aspect, uh, the notion of, of bodies and movement. I'm wondering if Henry, Justine, or, or Ralph want to weigh in on that. Ralph, <laughs> my sweet friend, I wanna hear what you have to say. <laughs> Um, and could you uh, 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 say that question again? Just yeah, to make sure. the, 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 the part with the house ballroom community around uh, dance, movement, choreography, the movement of the body, how do, you, how do you think that through as someone who's involved inside of the community? Um, I guess, I mean, I find when I explain, when I teach, what I, what I know about Vogue, I, I always go back to this idea of ballroom that is continued throughout all the categories. And in that this, when you're at a ball, it's about this embodiment or this uh, creating uh, or like becoming uh, something that maybe is not your everyday. And it's just, it's a moment for, uh, uh, this, uh, I don't know, it's like, it's like created self. Um, so I feel like it's this embodiment of iconography, but embodiment of Marilyn or Beyonce or, <laughs> and I feel like when my history I know about Vogue is that specifically it came from the category that, called, that was called presentation in that people would pull images from the Vogue magazine and present it to the judges and as the form extended and kind of continued you have the original the only way called old way 
And as the form continued on as well, it was informed by, at the time, from breakdancing, from popping, uh, also martial arts. Uh, and as it extended uh, into other forms, we have the form that is called New Way. And then as it even got broader, uh, the trans women, the femme queens of the community created their form that was more feminine, uh, which became Vogue, Vogue Femme. Um, I feel like throughout all these three forms, uh, the same stays true in that it's an embodiment. And I feel like a taking up space through movement. And I, I don't know, I guess for me, as I use Vogue, not just within a ballroom context, but in my own creative practice, uh, choreographically, I find what I what I, I glean the most out of it is this ability to see all around you at the same time. This awareness that I find is unique to ballroom, but also to street dance culture in general, us not having a frontal performative space. Well, technically we have the judges when you're at a ball, but this awareness that I think is uniquely ballroom and street dance. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say maybe for now. Michael, do you want to add to that? Well, I, I like, first of all, your historical narrative was pretty much on point. The thing around the presentation, he's right, that Vogue was called Pop, Dip, and Spin. And you popped and you dipped and spun. I just said it's self explanatory. Um, but the conversation, so this is, there is a sort of a, um, controversy, if you will. I don't call it controversy the two sort of sided stories of where Vogue came from. One is that Paris Dupree, who's no longer here, remember I said that she's one of the five, we call, I call five freedom fighters, and she becomes one of the mothers of the modern house ball community, that she created Vogue in the early 70s. The other story is that black gay men and black trans women in prison created it. It could be the same story, because Paris could have went to prison and, <laughs> and, and created it. But absolutely so on point, but the Vogue is also about how one tells one. Let me back up to that. That's where my Holy Ghost moment comes in. So I, 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 my definition of theology is not religion necessarily. The religion can be theological, but everything theological is not religious. The theology for me is when communities make meaning out of their life and suffering. So if I think about black music, particularly in the U.S. context, that all black music is theological, right? So you think about the spirituals that were created during slaveocracy. Here's the people. It's a, there's a term we call theodicy. Asking in this omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient God, if you're all these things, why are we suffering so? Why am I praying to you if you're all these things that I'm suffering? So spirituals are created in that conversation, but they also become a way to have a language so the master could not own it and a way to organize. Blues, it's not accidental, particularly Southern blues creates itself after slavery, right? A moan of a people, right? We free, really not, right? I could talk about jazz and hip hop and all these other things. And so for me, Vogue is that same thing, right? It's a theology, right? A theology of telling one's own story when you've been told your story is not worthy. Right. So thank you. Laugh at this one. <laughs> um, we we spoke earlier about the the seventies when uh, well I don't know if you were in New York then I was, <laughs> but um, a lot of the people that I was in class with, they had maybe we could say an underground career, and they would take class with us in the overground career the techniques that were, or should I say, accepted. And uh, you very rarely had the opportunity to see some of the vocabularies or the movements that they were doing. And I spoke earlier on, that was the time Madonna was also taking class with us. How do you feel about the appropriation of all that vocabulary that you've developed by the more formal 
vocabularies. <laughs> One of the tenets of womanism, the last tenet of the fifth tenet is called appropriation reciprocity. It's an interesting dialect, right? Appropriation reciprocity. Part of it is that I, as a black man, can't be a womanist because I'm a man. But I can use womanist the, the theology as a methodology as long as I also give back. So appropriation reciprocity. Uh, historically, that's not been the case for black folk, period. And so, but one has to oftentimes, sometimes we all sit in spaces of privilege. I'm a black gay man. And I understand that just because I'm black and gay does not eradicate me being patriarchal. I'm real clear about that. And black gay men have difficulties in critiquing our patriarchy, especially our patriarchal formation, especially in the house wall community. Here's a community that was created by trans women that the first gay men didn't, partic didn't participate almost 50 years later. And if you go to a ball, you would never know that. That black gay men create the categories and how you should walk and how you should behave as trans women, right? Um, so that being the case, one of the things, so Madonna, absolutely, I talked about and Jenny Livingston, but it's not just white folk. If you live in the U.S. and all of the black reality TV shows that the cis women on there use black gay lingo, language, right? And they perform like these black trans women. They dress and perform. And part of that is there are a lot of black and Latino gay men in the U.S. who are hairdressers, who are stylists, who are makeup artists, who are choreographers, and who take these ballroom videos and show them to these performers. And they act, and not just reality TV show, but a lot of the performers. The thing, if I had longer time, I could show you some things. The thing that Beyonce does, that's Leone. Leone created that. But she, <laughs> right? But, but she doesn't get, and so oftentimes, let me back into that slide now, the Holy Ghost. Moment. So, um, and a couple of colleagues of mine, white feminists, who said to me, Michael, I like you know your talk, blah, 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 and all this other stuff. However, they said that oftentimes I see these trans women, especially in Paris, it's burning, that are reducing cis women to hyper notions of femininity. I couldn't disagree. There's some foundational truth in that. But it's short sighted in the fact that it doesn't allow for contemporary. Of analysis, which is not only the, the creation of social media and what I just said about these black Latino gay men, right? You know. And so you're having cis women now on social media looking at these trans women doing their bodies a certain kind of way, performing a certain kind of way, dressing a certain kind of way, and the question is who's zooming who now, right? That these cis women are looking through the lens of trans women about their own sort of womanhood. So there's this interesting dialectical tension. I, one of the things I like about ballroom is that it's never necessarily interesting to reconcile the tension. It invites a problem, right? But it likes wrestling with it because in wrestling with stuff, it creates new, new ways of being. It forms new theoretical reciprocity, but it forms new theoretical frameworks and all these other things. So it wrestles with it, not necessarily have to reconcile. So to your wonderful question, it, it, it can be irritating, but you begin, because of social media, one of the benefits of social media is now it's easier for you to say, this is where you're going from, mm -hmm. as opposed to before. Last thing, um, I don't know if many of you folks know who the model Amber Rose is, Kanye West's ex. Um, Amber Rose was in the house ball community, actually. She's from Philadelphia. She was in the house of Quran. Um, her name was Paris Quran. But that wasn't her look. She got that look from a, a black trans woman from Chicago named Tanya Quiet. If I had longer time, I can put them next to one another. And even Tanya walking in Philadelphia, Paris is. I mean, where Amber's from. Now, we don't mind that necessarily, but you have to then, 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 then give credit to, because you, but we all borrow from one another. And so that some, sometimes is the problem for, for me. Is that Beyonce doesn't say I get this from Leone, but I mean, he mentioned Beyonce. I'm a Janet Jackson fan. And the difference between Janet Jackson is that Danielle um, Polanco 
Then your ninja who is a choreographer who's been a lot of people's stuff. She choreographed dance, Beyonce stuff. She went to Walker Balls in the House of Ninja um, at the House of Latex Ball, and Janet went with her, and she she contextualized it on MySpace. It's like yeah, I don't call it on MySpace um, to own right that I'm having a relationship with this community. So in many ways, if you see me do something, this is where it comes from. But it's it's, it's real hard. Last thing I'll say about this, I always say last thing that it's an absolute salacious relationship because when you have a community that's been so invisibilized, the politics are wanting to be visible. The politics are wanting to be legible. The po- when you've been told you don't matter. And when you're looking, the problem in many ways of the marginal is that it wants to not be marginal. And so, in wanting not to be marginal anymore, you're so happy when you think the oppressor approves and sees you. Thank you. Michael, I wonder if any of you have anything to add. And in the meantime, we'll get our microphones um, set up so we can take uh, questions as well uh, from the audience. We're not passing the microphones around for COVID reasons and uh, all of that, but we'll have a microphone set up. So please do come forward to ask a question if you'd, if you'd like. I want to repeat something that you just said, because I'm like, yes. Um, where you said it's not interesting to reconcile the tension. And I just like, I don't know, I'm just looking at you two because we've been dancing together since I arrived here and we've been like talking so much about um, not smoothing over, not correcting mistakes, uh, but being with them and being in, in, in dynamic relationship with them so they can become something else. And I just feel like he found the perfect sentence <laughs> for that. I will absolutely um, credit you every time I quote you. Um, uh, yeah, I just think that that's such an important thing to think about. And I mean, for me, I think I, I have zero experience in ball, ballroom culture other than watching my friends who are watching Ralph bring it into this community, into this dance community. And because I'm just going to talk about you for a second, Ralph. Is that okay? All right. Uh, Ralph lives in many, in like many dance communities. So there's something so beautiful about that because he's rhizomatic in his own existence as a dancer in this, in, in the dance community. But this is like, because of he's in so many places and probably exhausted. (laughs) Um, we all get to share uh, uh, in the language through the transmission through bodies. So it's not me talking to Ralph about ballroom that I get to experience ballroom, but it's in watching him do it or showing we both taught at a dance school this summer and he was teaching it. And, and it's like in those that I just don't want to underestimate the, the transmission between bodies, bodies in proximity, which has been part of the morning of the last two years, I think, for most people, all people, not dancers, we're not that special. Yeah, um, but I do think it's really important uh, to recognize that, you know, I used to say communities get built over plie, you know, and communities get built over uh, any gesture and For me, that's the way that dance can be radical, is that it can be aspirational space instead of status quo space, and that we can take the forms we've used and and not reconcile the tension in order to find out what else it could do. So if you saw Naomi in the Nike commercial, she does this thing where she's standing here. It's all a lot of commercial and things to do with it. And then she drops to the floor. That's called the Maka Ella dip. People outside of the community can modify them for the death slot. But in calling the death slot, my my great mentor, who's much younger than me, um, and colleague now, Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman, she crystal, crystal I can't. She did this Christology of this crucifixion resurrection. I talked to you earlier about, I do the stretch analogies, Janet Jackson 2004 Super Bowl incident. What is the problem of the black woman's body that has been crucified 
and resurrected for other people. Same thing with Naomi. So I was going to show the videos, the long video, so I didn't show it, of her voguing in Paris. She's holding space. And towards the end, she does it quite a few times, but towards the end, you hear the whole club saying, Naomi, Naomi. Most of them young black gay men, young black or, or of color gay men. Naomi. It's almost like haunting in the sense that it's like hearing the word Jesus over and over in a church chant. Salvation. This is Latin word called kenosis, the emptying of oneself. That a lot of these particularly black trans women empty oneself for the redemption for everybody else. As you saw Princess Jarnay perform, she was in pain. She's in pain, black woman. But she emptied herself for the elation for everyone else. And women, period, are taught that that's a virtue. Women, period. Black women particularly. And so womanist theology co corrects that. That, it's, that the redemptive suffering is not a virtue, but redemptive self-loveliness. Mm -hmm. Ralph, do you have anything to add, Ralph? Um, I guess it's a tangent, but I feel it's uh, it's still in the realm of of what we're talking about. And um, I've been asked to teach a lot the past few months and specifically at places that would be considered contemporary spaces of dance. And I've been really trying to analyze for me, what does contemporary mean? What is contemporary practice? Is there a technique that is codified in contemporary ways of moving? And because of my multitude of histories of training of of mentors I, I i found it quite confronting and uh i i've i've been in and in that been teaching things that i think is contemporary uh which has been vogue <laughs> so when i would say i'm teaching a contemporary class i'm actually teaching vogue um because it is my contemporary it is my of the now it is my movement that is current to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested, I don't know, I mean, anyone in the room right now, of uh, uh, that idea of contemporary. And also, I guess, it's specific and it's contextual because for what might not be contemporary for you, Michael, it might is contemporary to me. Um, and I guess it's this idea of value of technique, technique, in the broadest of senses, um, and how, I guess, how framing something, which I've done recently too, like framing hand performance to a tondu in ballet and uh, allowing others to understand the value of that movement, uh, I've, I've noticed has shifted how people approach learning, uh, specifically Vogue, and also, I'm a runway girl too, so runway. Um, it's been just an interesting uh, kind of like case study specifically to teaching uh, what I know. I, I, I like your assertion. It may not be contemporary for you, Michael. No. <laughs> <laughs> I like, no, I like it. And partly because even what you just did, your gesture, so the hand performance. And so it's interesting that it has become this. When I was younger, the notion of hand performance for the particular vote he's talking about vote film was that you had to stretch. There was not this, you had to boom, it was points. And so the technique has changed, particularly because I think a different generation is having a different kind of conversation. It's almost like coming to us, as we will say that. So thank you for that again. Uh, we have time for questions. So if you could just come to the microphone so everybody can hear you. Yeah, please. The mic is not too high. <laughs> it is very high. 
<laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So honestly, I'm mind blown by this whole conversation. Thank you for highlighting um, the differences between the two pandemics, and the thing that unites between them both is the racial disparities. And I'm just like heartbroken that within decades and decades, CDC didn't care enough to see why HIV was prevalent specifically within a specific group within the Black community. But once COVID-19 hits and Western countries are affected, we get a vaccine within a year, everything changes. So to segue, I'm really curious, uh, after COVID-19 was a pandemic, the space of the ballroom, how did it change from actually being a physical space for kinship, moving to virtual? And how did that look like during lockdown on all the social interaction restrictions and everything? Thank you. I like your excitement. I got a question. I, um, so I'll be real brief. You know, we were talking and I'm zoomed out. I was so glad that we were able to do this because I am absolutely zoomed out. And in the beginning of the pandemic, of course, it was absolutely wonderful. But after a while, so they started doing virtual balls and ballrooms an organizing group, I mean, an organizing community. And in, in March of 2020, there's a woman named Dr. Jackie, Jacqueline, what it comes to. She's a woman as theologian and she is the first, she's a pastor, the first African-American first woman pastor of the uh, Middle Collegiate Church in their 300-year history. And she, they do this annual conference, and the, the, the theme of the conference was called Radical Love. So she asked me, and my, anyone watch Pose here? You just, you know, it's Okay. <laughs> so the one who plays Electra on Pose is my one of my very best friends. Uh, and uh, I was a consultant for the show, and they knew I could get her. And so she's actually in the house that I'm in. And so me and her did a talk around what this ballroom had to say in this moment of COVID. And I talked about, so to your point, I talked about COVID in many ways, in my analysis, that the universe had COVID make us take a global pause. In one moment, we all had to sit still. Silence is always so important to not only hear one's own voice, the same voice in the universe, but to recognize that other voices in your head are not yours, they've been put in your head, told you you were not good enough, you're not you're too thin, you're too black, all those other things, and you can let those go. Right, but we walked, we were in a global pause, and I thought that the universe is asking us to um, ponder on three propositions. One is a philosophical one, and that is, who do you desire to be now? Not who are you, but who do you desire to be? You had the choice to choose who you want to be now. The second one was a theological one, which is, how do you desire to love and love more expansively? That in the work that we do, if it's not grounded in the ethics of love, is moot. And the third one was a political one. Now, how do we begin to move away from politically organizing around the right not to die and move towards the right to live? Those are two separate things. And particularly marginal communities have been told that you have a right not to die. That's very different than say you have a right to live. Right? And so COVID in many ways, made us sit. So it's not that you, know, you have great, you're a great critique around Western communities and COVID, but part of the reason we're able to see these disparities around health equities, because co everyone had to sit still, they had to sit still. It was very different than AIDS. But also, and also, that COVID and the strategies, particularly in New York City, borrowed from AIDS strategies, the history of AIDS. So it borrowed from those things. And so the last thing I'll say about this, not only in the U.S. context, we had January 6th and so, uh, um, that happened and the, the, the Capitol insurrection, but May of last year was a George Floyd murder. And the only reason, most of the reason that we paid attention to it because we were sitting still. But let me tell you where we were not sitting still enough. In Minneapolis, same city, a month later, Black trans woman named Ayanna Dior gets beat by a mob, but I don't mean 10, I don't mean 20, about 30 or 40 people in a store, dragged out of a store, beat, beat. She somehow has a historical wherewithal to drag herself back in the store and say, if I'm going to be beat or murdered, 
it will be on camera. So the world over will see what happens, not just to me, but those who look like me. It's very, you ever knew the story of Emmett Till in 1954, who was beaten, murdered, who was a white woman, and his mother made a decision not to beautify the body, have an open casket, and have the black publications take pictures and said, if I do something to the body, the world over would never know what's happening to black people in the South. The same conversation. But we're sitting still, and the conversation is, how don't we know about this story? How again are we missing the moment? And it re-energized Black Lives Matter. In fact, it re-energized, it allowed for the conversation around Black Trans Lives Matter, but, but that was after her, right? And so part of the difficulty in Black community around Black Lives Matters is that around Black trans women continue, but around black, black trans women being beaten and brutalized, we have to sit with that they're being beaten and brutalized mostly by black cis men. So the very people we're organizing around police brutality over are the ones killing these black trans women. It's challenging, it's difficult. And we have to wrestle with it. But even during COVID, we didn't sit still enough to remember her. She, she, she lives though. She lives. Yeah, please come on. If you could touch the microphone. Weird connections there. I'm still not sure of how I'm going to deliver this. But going back into the appropriation talk and the Black Life uh, Matters movement. Hi. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, how non white, non people of color can approach this and give the space to the people to voice, like give the voice to the people that are living this. Because I remember during the um, Black Lives Matter movement, social media for me became like a, a comeback of the pop, pop art movement of replication, like Andy Warhol type of thing. like. Mona Lisa was no longer Mona Lisa, like the icon and the subject lost its meaning. So on social media with this like post, constant post, it kind of starts to lose its meaning because it's like overshare. So you talk, you're talking about Madonna not never having like spoke and given recognition and where she comes from, like with her Vogue um, video, like how how can we give this space? How can we not overtake this talk and make it like part of the white humans and be like a show like, oh yeah, we are doing this. We are showing this. We are talking about this, but we are not letting the people that are living this talk about it. But how, how do we step aside and allow those voices when the word is white dominance and usually they don't like they don't listen to other voices you know i don't know if this makes sense i'm so no, sorry it's just like so the older i get technology and i i'm trying to be friends with technology I, it just and I'm trying to work it out and it's just catch up. If I trying to play catch up, uh, M asked me, "Are you on social media?" I said, "My kids call me a granddad because I'm on, only thing I'm on is Facebook, right?" But the beautiful thing about your generation is the ability to engage through social media, right? That information is quick, fast. You're much more entrepreneurial, especially young black folk are much more entrepreneurial than my generation. I was taught that if you wanted to make it, you went to college and you did these things and you work for, uh, work for a company and you rise up the ladder. And so the younger folk are saying, no, I can monetize. I can. And so this is a beautiful thing. What's, but what happens though, so there's always a, a cost, is that it disallows a certain kind of intimacy. It disallows a certain kind of community building. And it can become what you were suggesting platform building. 
That's across all demographics. So to your point, I'm a member of Ultra Red, and part of one of the Ultra Red protocols is the notion of listening. Right. So how do I then, if I'm a black gay man and I want to support black trans women, how do I listen to their stories, even about my black patriarchy? Even if I'm in the house ball community and I've created all these spaces and I'm telling black trans women how they should dress, blah, blah, blah. How do I listen to that? And not allow for a space. The allow one says that I'm the only one who has the power. So how do I share space? And that then there's a history around me having space that I then now have to give up something. And I think that's sort of the challenge. This is around power in many ways. How does one give up power? in order to, to, to share it. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I do think that a great colleague of mine named Robert Simba, who's brilliant genius, a white gay South African man, who, who for me models the best behavior to what you are suggesting. But I, I think that folks just have to always be in dialogue and try not to get your feelings hurt when people push you back. Right? But you don't necessarily have to feel guilty or having to reconcile. Always wrestling with something creates a space. Last thing I'll say, stretch another stretch analogy. I do public health. One of the things is public health. We do public health. And particularly, I was doing it around HIV prevention. One of the things I was talking to Emma is that I have to sit in a space to be uncomfortable to know that I am dependent upon people becoming HIV positive in order to have a job. That's real. I am dependent upon people becoming HIV positive. In fact, my job should, to, should be around making me unemployed if I was interested in eradicating HIV. But I have to sit and wrestle with that. I don't have to reconcile it. But if I stay in space of uncomfortability, if I continue to push back right, on myself and ask myself those questions, um, I think that those things. So to, to that stretch analogy, it is absolutely the same thing to continue to engage in those kind of dialogues and don't get your feelings hurt. I do think that white folk need to talk to white folk about white supremacy. And real quick, I think men have to talk to men about patriarchy. Women are always taught, always told to teach men how to be less patriarchal. Not when you created the shit. <laughs> you know, it is, it's too oppressive, me as a black man, to teach you how to be, all of those things. So I think that we, in, in that way, to be in dialogue and not expect black folk to teach you how to be, but to be in, just continue to be in dialogue. Uh, we're close to uh, um, being um, out of time, and I'm going to let everyone have a minute just to, to close um, uh, here. But part of uh, inviting Michael here was to uh, um, make some introductions in Vancouver to, to be here, but also to think about some research questions in the future that are both health-related, arts and culture-related, and, and see what other conversations might emerge in the in the coming years. But I'll start on the far end, Henry, if you have any final thoughts to, to share to, to close out. Um, when are we going to get you back to teach some uh, workshops? <laughs> you know, I am in awe, I want to say, of you all. I'm in awe, so whenever I'm invited back, I just it would be an absolute utter privilege. And I don't say that to be to, to sit up here so y'all can say, oh, it's such a wonderful man. It, I really, really mean to be an absolute utter privilege. Because I'm sure I have a student who would like to be You better say yes. <laughs> uh, Travis? Yeah, I, I, I just want to um, reflect. Uh, what, 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 what was the name of the the performer we were watching on the uh, the one you were saying she's she's expressing her pain and giving us her yes yeah Jane I was thinking about I was feeling um, I was feeling like a gift from her performance that was a real um, it felt like an embrace and an activation and I was thinking about this um, I just started reading. Um, Adrian Marie Brown's book, um, Pleasure Activism. And I was thinking like this, this like intervention that builds on um, pleasure and self-love and, and group love and um, 
just like one little um, anecdote to, to share with you. Actually, it's, it's about Ralph. I'm destined, Ralph, to only ever know you or meet you via Zoom because um, when COVID happened and, and, and we were locked down and spending all this time, I was with, um, with my new boyfriend who's here, Jason. <laughs> Jason. So he said, oh, hey, there's this, this great Vogue uh, instructor, and now we can take the class online. I have to tell you, I would probably not have walked into a Vogue class, just to be totally honest, but, you know, on Zoom, here we are. <laughs> now I will. Now I will. But, um, you know, so I asked Jason today, you know, just we were talking about tonight and Ralph being here and, you know, like what, you know, what was that? What did you feel? What was that experience like? And and uh, you'll you'll correct me if I if I get this wrong, uh, Jay. But, I, th you know, I think really what he was reflecting was a feeling of escape and inclusion. So escape from, you know, the the stress and anxiety of the pandemic. Uh, he, I mean, Jason works front line, like all of these kinds of concerns, but inclusion, like really like the way in which Ralph, even via Zoom kind of brought us in, brought me in as someone who felt like an outsider. And I think that, that kind of, to me, that intervention, that like pleasure activism is like, got to be the way to go. <laughs> like, I'm just like leaving tonight thinking like, how do I hold up more of these interventions locally? Because I think, I think we really need it. So thanks for inspiring us. Justine? Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for this time with you and the time in the fluorescent lights in the room before. Um, <laughs> uh, and I just... I think Zara, who did the wonderful choreography over there a few moments ago, we were talking the other day about how dance is spiritual, because uh, it just is. Um, and I'll totally take my earrings off and fight you in the hallway if you don't agree with me. Uh, <laughs> no, I won't really, because, you know, I'm supposed to be an adult now. Um, but I love this idea that, and I think the reason it's spiritual is because you said it exactly. I did write some things down, that it convenes the folk around the notion of mattering. And I think that is such a base thing for people of color and we were talking before in the fluorescent lit room is that how do we activate or make space for folks of color within this school to feel like they can take space uh, easily and and I think you've made it really clear for me that it's about making people feel that they matter uh, and it shouldn't yeah, I'm just, I'm really grateful for your ability to, attark, to attark, attark, articulate, <laughs> um, to articulate what I feel in my body, because I feel like I feel, I feel, I always say I feel, um, but you have this way of organizing language in a way that is so, uh, I'm like, that's the feeling. So thanks for bringing words to my feelings. Yeah. Ralph? Uh, um, yeah, I think what, what, what's, what comes to the surface is this idea of community. And I feel like this word community is thrown out, is thrown in our, in our conversations a lot right now, as many large organizations try to struggle with the idea of equity and diversity and <laughs> inclusion yeah. when there are organizations, there are communities and cultures that are founded by this and continue and, and continue because of this necessity of community. Um, just seeing, we've talked in, the, in a bus ride one time, how um, a lot of, how many cultural dance firms, but also dance firms that come from marginalized communities, people of color, queer people, that community is also the dance. That is, it is not it, it is not fragmented. It's not segmented. And I think ballroom, even this conversation that I had with Michael on the little Zoom prior to this last week, um, them knowing Deshaun, of course, and Deshaun is my father, and this idea of this connectivity that ballroom is able to create even from generationally, but also through distance, is really exciting. And I think 
is what keeps me inspired and uh and will continue to keep me inspired based on the structure of ballroom um yeah it's it's i just want to say thank you again uh for letting me be a part of this and uh it just says fueled it's midnight here but i'm so fueled to do more and um i'll say hi to twisted here while, while i'm in toronto say hi to everyone here and let them know i I was able to share a virtual space with you, Michael, and everyone here, uh, and continue doing the work. And hopefully, we get to bring you back here in some way or form with Van Vogue Jam. So, um, am <laughs> we'll, we'll chat sometime soon, hopefully. Um, but yeah. And before I give you the last word, uh, Michael, I just wanted to take the time to thank the people who actually really put this evening together, which is. Melissa Roach, who's sitting up in the corner. Aliha Barty, who went and got Tylenol from London Drugs. <laughs> it wasn't me. And, and Fiorella Pinios, who's worked in the office for many, many years, and it's her last day tomorrow. So just wanted to thank you all. It is very difficult to put on a public event in this time. So over to you, Michael, for the final word. Well, first of all, when she came in with the Tylenol, I said, did I make you go get this? She said, he's going to bring it back. <laughs> uh, so I would say you, Ralph. You know, I, you know, Emma's gonna have you involved because he said that you came through Brooklyn style. Like, yo, son, I'm not involved. No, just, um, <laughs> um, but so this notion of legacy and and so his father, Deshawn, I absolutely, utterly love. Um, Deshawn is like my son. It's not my son because my great friend Daryl Brown is Deshawn's father, but Deshawn worked for me in 2004. In fact, my son Pony and him co created Vogue Evolution, which is the very first dance group, the very first openly uh, gay and trans black LGBT group that went on MTV's America's Best Dance Group. Um, and so Deshawn's brilliant, he is the host. Of legendary, which the shows on HBO. So I love Deshaun, absolutely love. So this is kinship in, in, in many ways. So, so a couple, couple things. One, to, to your point, you know, there's a great documentary on PBS by Henry Louis Gates about the black church. And I, you know, this is going to be, so don't know why, he doesn't know me, so I'm not, I have a little critique. But not of the documentary, because a lot of his documentaries are very um, safe. But this particular documentary did this wonderful historical net, this arc that started prior to us becoming Christians, prior to us becoming slaves, that even had to act up with it. I was, I was blown away. Um, but one of the things I was real clear about, of being clear, and that just made it, that concretized it for me, was that on the plantation where slaves could not worship with the master, so they created this underground praise house that they came to. It was the only space that, that they felt that they mattered, this praise house. And so you heard me talk about as we moved to Harlem, and we could not be open with our people. We had to create this underground praise house that we call the Black Church. Ballroom is the Black Church. I'm real clear about it. It doesn't mean that it's just for black folk, but it is created and grounded in the, the ontology of blackness, and therefore it is a radical inclusivity. It includes everyone. It does not desire to create the counter KKK, the counter oppressive structure. It includes even those who've been historically non inclusive to it. So I just want to end with that. I want to thank you all for allowing me to be in your space. I utterly was moved. The fact that you all came, the fact that you've been so attentive just blows me away. So I thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, M, for the work. I mean, he's been trying to get me here. He was a man of his word. He got me here. We were going to come in the midst of COVID, and it shut everything down. So I want to thank you. And thank you, wonderful, absolutely hospitable staff up there. So thank you as well. And the tech people, y'all did great. My tech people. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good night.